This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. And you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock. I don't necessarily feel like that's my job is to yell at people to finish it on a certain day. I mean, I'm happy to let other people yell at us to get it done because I feel like other people can sell the record. That's their job. My job is to make sure that it's the most beautiful record possible. And I mean, I don't want to like never finish a record. That's not my goal, but I don't want to put something out that's stupid and that isn't the, 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 um, what the artist feels like is in their imagination. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com slash rockstars. The Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre provides unequaled headroom and linear output regardless of transient audio peaks, capturing critical details from your microphone. The 100 series amplifiers were used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and John Lennon. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio at spectra1964.com or call them at 801-797-0642. Studio One from PreSonus is the ideal DAW for your home studio, taking you from songwriting all the way through mixing and mastering with a full suite of virtual instruments, guitar amps, and plugins for creative inspiration. It's easy to use for the beginner, yet fully customizable for your high-speed workflow as you become an expert. Get started now with Studio One Artist and PreSonus Sphere for access to all software, learning, and creative collaboration at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Sean Everett, a Juno and Grammy-winning Canadian producer, engineer, and also previously a guest on episode 137. In that interview, we talked with Sean about his background in schooling and his production and mixing philosophies and a lot more. So I'll include a link to that episode if you want to go listen to that. Sean has worked with many great artists, including Grammy-winning Alabama Shakes, Weezer, Margaret Glaspy, Pete Yorn, Warpaint, John Legend, The Killers, Julian Casablancas, The Voids, Kesha, Harmar, Superstar, Local Natives, and many, many, many others. And in 2019, he won his fifth Grammy for mixing Casey Musgraves' Golden Hour, which included songwriting and production from Daniel Tashin and engineering from Craig Alvin, both previous guests on the podcast as well. And you can hear their episodes on 176 and 232, and I'll have links to all these episodes in the show notes so you can check those out. Between the last time that I had Sean on the show and this episode, I've become a huge fan of Sound and Color by the Alabama Shakes, which Sean engineered and mixed, winning a Grammy in 2015, and this particular record has become a, a reference for mixing for me of what a great mix should sound like. So I'm very excited to talk with Sean today about that record, talk about Golden Hour and working with Casey Musgraves, and just catch back up. So please welcome Sean Everett to Recording Studio Rockstars. Sean, are you ready to rock yet again, man? Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Good, man. It's great to have you on the show, man. A pleasure to hang out with you. Um, for some context, here we are still in the middle of quarantine. This episode will be out later than we do the interview, but uh, 
hopefully by the time people hear this, things will have felt a little bit more back to normal. I don't know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, how have you been, man? Are you uh, are you very busy during this time? Yeah, it's um, it's been pretty busy. It's um, it's uh, uh we have a, a um nine month old daughter. Um, oh, wow. so it's been uh, it's been um interesting time because it, we've been basically just locked in this building and I've been mixing and and then looking after the baby. So. It's been kind of wild. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like looking after the baby would describe both things, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, time has become very um, precious at the moment. But it's, it's kind of, uh, it kind of feels like I'm in, like, uh, I grew up in the, in the mountains of Canada. So it kind of feels like I'm back there again in, in the isolation or something, just being with family and um, making music or something like that. It kind of reminds me of, growing up or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds great. Um, I've had some great, you know, quarantine time hanging out and connecting with my kid, my daughter. And that's one of the benefits about doing this is I think if, if things are in the right kind of way for you, it really gives you a chance to, to get closer with your family. Yeah. Somehow it's like, um, chaotic with work, but also I'm getting more family time. So it's like a kind of a strange, uh, strange combination of, of, Chaos, chaos and relaxation. Yeah, indeed. Well, yeah. we appreciate you taking time out for us. Um, tell us a little bit, give us a bit of a recap on where you are and what your studio surroundings are like. You know, what is your studio that you're mixing from right now? Um, well, probably about six, maybe seven years ago, um, I kind of got um, pretty obsessed with, I, I, was, I, I was living in downtown Los Angeles and um, the girl who eventually would become my wife, um, we were going to um, some different warehouse parties and stuff like that in downtown Los Angeles. And she seemed like a pretty, um, like a, a kind of, there wasn't, there wasn't, wasn't much going on in, in, in this kind of warehouse district area of Los Angeles, other than kind of young people going to these kind of fun parties. And it just yeah. kind of seemed very artful and kind of exciting. And I kind of got obsessed realizing that even though it was in downtown LA, it was on the other side of where the big buildings were. And the yeah. real estate seemed relatively, um, relatively cheap actually compared to most of Los Angeles. So I had saved up some money and I was trying to see if I could get one of these. I'd imagine building a house with like a studio in it or something like that. And, um, when I was in New York, I saw a place that looked really cool and a picture online. And, um, I kind of obsessively, tried to buy this place for about a year um, and then uh, eventually got a pretty good deal on it. Um, and then we moved in and made a house and then made a kind of studio on one side of the house on the other side. And then um, luckily I got it when I, I did, because right after that I w probably wouldn't have been able to afford it because the, um, the, the, the whole area that I thought was cool that no one was going to, all of a sudden everyone was going to it and coffee shops all over the place. And I mean, it's become yeah. much uh, I mean, when I moved in here, I thought I was going to get murdered. <laughs> well, and now I mean, there's a, it felt a bit like that in East Nashville. Now a Soho here too. Yeah, now there's a Soho house literally beside me. So it went from, um, <laughs> it went completely the opposite. I mean, but who knows what's going to happen by the time quarantine is done. We'll probably be back to the way it was when I got it. <laughs> well, hopefully you can get another one. Maybe the price will drop and just pick yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to make any other comments about that? I feel like that is, a, a, for, for those of us who are listening and are maybe younger and haven't seen that, that is a cycle <laughs> of the way cities go. And, you know, it is smart to look for the place that you think is affordable now and might be where everybody else wants to move as things pick up. And that can be a great choice. Yeah. I mean, I never really um, thought about getting into the uh, real estate bills business, but if I suddenly in my, um, if I, when my, as an old man, I decide to become a real estate shark, I'm just going to sniff out <laughs> where all the kids are making raves and I'm going to buy, buy up all the land. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, I remember my mom told me once, she was like, real estate, that's the best investment you can make. Because I think it was the one that worked for her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 can, I can imagine that. It seems like, um, seems like if I were to ever sell it, I mean, I, I don't think I will, but if I were to ever sell my property, I'll end up making more money on real estate than I ever would be making albums. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I certainly know a studio here in Nashville where 
he shut down his studio because he could make more money renting it out as like a little boutique shop. Right, right. Instead of running a studio. But, you know, not that we're here to talk about real estate, but just yeah. a <laughs> reminder to people like, be encouraged when you're looking around for a place to buy and start a studio that, you know, that area of your town that feels like it could be pretty cool to you, but it's a little sketchy. Like that might be a great choice for, for starting out because 10 years later, you might, well, you might be right in the middle of the best spot. Yeah. I mean, everyone thought I was psychotic when I bought this place. They were all telling me it was such a bad idea. I mean, maybe it was a bad idea. I mean, it could have been a bad idea, but I mean, to me, it just seemed like kind of, um, I kind of, I mean, I, when I grew up, my dad liked getting these weird old buildings and, and for an, a, a long period of time, we lived in a fifties gas station. My dad bought um, oh, like cool. an old fifties an old gas station and, and made it like a house. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, and I'd be playing outside by the old, um, uh, like gas pumps and people would pull up to get gas, but I mean, there's nothing in them. Um, and so I think that like just growing up like that, I mean, and then in my ha- house later, my dad, he used to own a restaurant he put the restaurant on the property. Um, like he got it moved, the whole restaurant moved to our backyard. And so that we could, uh, we, we, we would have like a rehearsal room in there, my band. And, and so he was just into kind of odd, play, you know, odd spots, you know, odd places. So I think that like, there's a little bit of that in me. Um, so it de- definitely like, even though some people thought it was a bad idea, it just, it, it, I think is exciting to me because it reminds me of my, my childhood. <laughs> That's cool. So rehearsing as a band, did you, was that your first gig? Was you just like, you go on the other side of the wall and now you're playing a, a rock show for your dad's restaurant? Well, no, the restaurant, um, what he, he had the restaurant in the very early eighties, but then by the time I was in high school, he'd s- sold it many years before that. And they, they were going to tear it down and build a subway. And they called him and said, cause he built the place. They called him and asked him if, if he wanted the building. And he said, yeah. So they, they put it on the back of a truck and just dropped it into our backyard. It was no longer a restaurant. It was just like, it'd become kind of like a space where my dad had his drums and Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That's hilarious. What a, that's a good story. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, and a closing thought on that is that I wonder if trusting your instinct, if you, if you have an artistic sense and you trust your instinct, it might guide you to a, a neighborhood that other artists would want to go to. And maybe you're right. You know, <laughs> you put your studio and your home in a place and sure enough, that will be the next neighborhood because other people who have similar sensibilities to you will want to go do that too. Yeah. I mean, that happened here for me. Yeah, yeah, East Nashville. I, I mean, I've heard the, the stories of how it has completely changed. Yeah, it turns out that they really just wanted to sell coffee for ten dollars a cup, but you know, it's all right. We'll, we'll get through yeah. it one way or another. If I, if I was a true real estate shark, I'd buy a bunch of the property and open up a coffee shop so I'd uh, so, boost all the the property value around. <laughs> no. Nice. Well, yeah. all right. So, so you built this wonderful home, and you got a studio there. And um, how would you describe your studio, and and you know how you're mixing now? Um, just like le- uh, like the layout of the the stuff, the gear. Like, what do you? Are you standing in a room full of bean bags? Uh, no, not exactly. There, there was actually when I there, when I when I found this building, strangely, um, there had been a studio in it already, um, and so. I didn't have a lot of money to to fix up the back to make it a livable to be, make it a house, because um, my wife would definitely have been real pissed if if if, there, if it was like not a normal living space. Um, right. So I basically had to spend all my money to make the back a house, and and luckily for me there was um, this this warehouse happened to have kind of a build out of a studio, um, and strangely like probably 10 years before all this, I had done an album um, with George Harrison's son named Danny Harrison. And he told me that his cousin and him had this studio downtown and he'd asked me to come see it. And I, and I never did. And then as it was closing the, as I was closing the, the deal for the, the, this building, the guy told me that the Harrison family used to own the building. And, and then I, and I was like, Oh my God, I think this is the studio that maybe he built. Oh, wow. And, and so I called him and I, and I asked him if, if it was it. It, it. it was. It was just, it turned out that it had been his studio. 
Um, so I didn't really have to, I mean, in the me- in the interim between when he owned it and then I got it, there was like, a, it was a rave spot. And so the spot that had been the studio had been, had been completely um, destroyed basically. Um, I mean, it just looked like a lot of people had maybe died in this room. Wow. Um, was it, was so, there like leftover rave paraphernalia, like, like, uh, moon goggles and strange clothing items. Yeah, just actually, later. yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. Did, like like glow sticks that no no longer illuminate. A hundred percent. There was lots of that. <laughs> there was a um, the uh, my wife's closet was once a DJ booth. Um, <laughs> so wow, yeah. Um, now, have you thought of a name for your studio? No, I haven't. Um, I, I, for some reason, I have a, a blank on that. I, I, for years, people have have been asking me for album credits, what the name is, and I always just tell them to name it whatever they want. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I for some reason, um, I, I never really, um, yeah, I never really thought of it like that. And yeah, I always thought of it just like the place that I work, as opposed to being an actual studio that. Uh, you know that I. Oops, sorry. It was old, a lot right. here. Um, I um, will. I will jump in and say that uh, I felt similarly, and it took another friend sort of offering up a name suggestion for it to finally stick for me. Oh really? But, yeah. yeah. I it was, mean, it was uh, a guy Pat Pat Sansone from Wilco was over working with me. He was like, "You should call it the Toy Box." And I was like, "All right." Oh, that's awesome. That's a good name. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, one that one that's kind of stuck is someone wrote it on the wall. They wrote because we have a chalk wall. They wrote um. Subtle McNuggets. So it seems like oh, most of the time it gets, it gets written to Subtle McNuggets. All right, I'm going to help you out right now on this on this episode. Rockstars, uh, cast your vote in the comments for Subtle McNugget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> help help Sean out. Yeah, or or I for a long time I kind of stopped doing it, but when I first got it, I, I always had CNN on the TV playing, and um, someone told me that uh, that the it should be called um, the Situation Room. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, that's pretty good, actually. Well, that sounds that sounds like that's an element of pressure to it. Yeah, yeah. Like intensity, yeah, high intensity. Yeah. Do you well, feel yeah, like just, recording sessions should include a level of high intensity or more of a level of of uh, relaxation? Uh, I prefer the relaxation. <laughs> 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 I don't exactly like going into a pressured environment every single day. <laughs> I think it's annoying when you when you have to go into a breath. <laughs> I'd rather not. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you only live once. I'd rather not have to live in hell every single day. Um, uh, you know, I, I think. Do yeah. would you would you agree though that that is true? You want to be relaxed, but somehow in that moment of performance, do you think that there's like you have to be on the edge of your seat somehow, or not necessarily? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, I don't think that 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 necessarily means that you have to live in like a state of doom at all times, you know? <laughs> I, it, 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 um, I think that like, I think that people can be serious about what they're doing without needing to be dicks about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, I feel like I'm always, you know, trying to be serious and trying to do my best work. And, and of course it gets pr- um, stressful, you know, trying to do the best that you can. And sometimes I feel like I don't get the, the best work unless I've kind of gone down the rabbit hole of kind of second guessing myself and, and feeling that kind of torture of, of like trying to do your best because sometimes that's when invention happens, Yeah, but it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily means that you have to um, e- exhibit that to everyone around you and, and like be a lunatic. Um, I mean, I feel like I could, it's like an internal pressure within myself that I just want to do the best job without needing to um, inflict that upon everybody that's around me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need to remind everybody of how hard you're working yeah. on it. You just need yeah. to work on it hard. Yeah, <laughs> just, do it, just do it and shut up. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, so um, what, what are some ways for you, I mean, it's been a couple of years since we spoke last. Um, do you have any thoughts on your own mixing process? You're obviously doing a lot now. Uh, are there some ways that come to mind that, that it has sort of evolved over the past couple of years for you? Like it's always evolving um i mean like i feel like it evolves almost you know i'll, I'll be doing uh maybe a, an album or something and then um and then maybe I'll, like two weeks goes by and, and then and then all of a sudden you're doing like a whole bunch of notes that someone's given you and 
in the two weeks, you've all of a sudden invented some new technique that you, in your mind, you think has reinvented the way you do things. And so then you open up the, the what you had worked on two weeks ago and you scoff at it thinking like, ha, like this joker that did this. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like it's constantly evolving and changing. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not even exactly sure what's happening, but I just feel like I, I almost get bo- bored with the way that I, I do something and then I just want to try, you know, and, you know, you, you just, there's like, like a constant, there's, I just feel like it's an infinite well of, of the way that you could f- uncover and figure out how to do things. It, never, it seems like it never stops. I, I just, I just yeah. like, it just, it always seems like there's more to learn or so. I don't know. It would be pretty boring if there wasn't something new to learn all the time. What would you do? Yeah. I mean, it's just like you hear an album and then it gives you a thought about just the whole construct of how things are built, the way music works. And, and then you think about it a different way. And, you know, it just, I feel like there's always something that's inspiring and making you think of something in a different, different light. Where are some places that you find yourself going, um, whether it's talking to people, watching something, listening to something, or reading, where you discover new techniques? You know, where somebody actually has to say, like this piece of this microphone, or or you know, some some technique in the studio. Um, strangely, um, it's not always about the microphone and things for me, or or the gear. It's more about like a methodology of like of how to do something or something like that, or just like, I, 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 I feel like I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, just like, like frequencies and like how it all kind of sits together in kind of like a curious way. And, you know, like different layers of frequencies. I'm always, I just, I feel like I'm always thinking about like frequencies as like a sandwich and just like the, the way that they kind of sit on top of each other. Um, mm-hmm. and I, and I think that that's kind of what I spend most of my time thinking about and, and how arrangements are built and, and why, you know, like a great arrangement recorded crappily can be a lot easier to mix than a horrible arrangement recorded great. Um, right. You know, that's a good just, point. It, that's a great point. It just seems like that there's like this kind of, there's just ways that things complement each other, you know, and um, and they just like, they kind of like hold each other's hands. And I'm always just kind of thinking a lot about that. Um, um, that was one of the things that Craig Alvin said he learned from Joe Ciccarelli was this idea that we're always mixing, which I feel mm-hmm. like is what you're talking about too. It's like before that you're, you're always producing, you know, it's like if, if the arrangement is correct, it puts the right frequencies in the right places yeah. that make a mix. Yeah, absolutely. You have to do way less. I mean, sometimes, sometimes when I'm, working on an album i'm just like constantly constantly mixing it just trying to see if like two textures will work up against each other and just trying all sorts of different you know running something through something to see if like it just if eventually something they just like kind of land you know like how how does it how does this stuff land on top of each other and I, and I, I like to listen to a lot of listening to a lot of like 80s kind of stuff recently mm-hmm. and just kind of interested how those records kind of sit together sonically and kind of seeing how like all the different parts and why, you know, it just, yeah, I I just think it's, I just think think that whole part of it is really interesting. Yeah. It's one of the things I love about um, deciding to make records for your whole life is it's like you're saying, every time you discover a new style of music, like it's, you're allowed to go, Explore it. You're allowed to make that the next thing you want to do. You know, whatever you want to do. Yeah, definitely. It's great. Do you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D-Click. D-clip, D-S, D-plosive, voice denoise, ozone multiband compression, EQ, and limiting on my voice. If you want great, consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. 
Have you ever struggled to finish a mix wondering if it was truly ready for mastering? Wouldn't it be great to have a trusted coach walk you through the final stages of mixing so that you could confidently deliver your mix for professional mastering knowing that it was just right? At soundquarter.com, home of the iterative mastering process, Brian Murphy is your trusted coach to listen to your needs and help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo at soundquarter.com. You you mentioned uh, layers of EQ, and if it's all right you, with you, I might start jumping into um, some specific questions a little bit, because that also cool. immediately made me think of um, Alabama Shake Sound and Color on, for example, on, um, on Don't Want to Fight, and then also on Future People, I felt particularly Don't Want to Fight, like that one just blew me away so much. I think I was texting you. I was like, dude, I can't get my mixes right now, you know, because I discovered uh, your, 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 uh, your mix. Um, oh, thanks. And that one uh, is like this incredible low end going on. And then when I started looking at it more closely, I started realizing, oh, I think like sometimes I look and I'm like, Oh, that's it's the the drums, like it's one thing. And then I'm like, look more closely, and it's like, oh, it's like layers of stuff going on. Like it maybe there's an overdub of of a sustaining kick drum hit with a mallet or something that causes it to ring out so nicely. Um, and I wondered uh-huh. if you wanted to talk about any of the stuff you remember from that record or that song, and just like, you know, how how did you arrive at some of the layers of low end frequencies and things like that to just make the whole thing sound deep? Um, well, uh, Blake Mills, who produced it, um, he was really, um, he, I think he bought this kick, maybe he bought it or he borrowed it. This, this kick drum that he had at the time that he brought to Nashville. That was, um, this kind of resident big kick drum. And, um, he had it in front of the drum set for a lot of the record. And, and then I don't know, remember even how we got to it, but at some point we took it off the drum set. And then we had like a bass amp that was reamping the kick drum into another room. That was, and then the hit that that drum was in front of the um, bass amp, and we were miking that. I think maybe to get some more separation. I can't remember exactly why we did that. Wow. Um, and uh, so a lot of that record had this kind of kick drum thing happening, um, which kind of brought to mind a lot of kind of hip hop records and um, kind of the use of 808. And yeah. so when I was, Oh, and Brittany, when we were doing it was really into um, the uh, James Blake record that had come out at that time. And there was a ton of low end on it. Um, and so it was one of the things that I kind of had in my sessions that I was just kind of, I mean, it's a very different type of music, but as far as like the low, way the low end sat, um, we were kind of thinking about the low end like a record like that when we were doing it. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's that reminder too that we can have a reference to pull us along creatively that might be a completely and utterly different style of music. Yeah, in fact, I think that that's kind of a lot of the times really useful because um, it. I feel like some, sometimes maybe referencing something that has nothing to do with the type of music you're working on can lead to a kind of form of, of invention. Um, I think that sometimes, like, maybe, maybe the the longer I do this, I feel like most of what creativity is is just figuring out how to combine two diverse elements that are in your mind. And the, the more diverse they are, and the more they complement each other, the more people think it's um, creative. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the newer it is, the more brilliant it is. Hopefully, maybe. Um, yeah. What yeah, about low end? I mean, like, you know, you talked yeah. about like a, a hip hop record. Um, obviously, hip hop's been around for a long time, and it's interesting too when you look at old school hip hop and new hip hop. How the low end has done this massive. It's like it. It's like we discovered a whole new octave or something. You know, everything just got lower. Yeah. Um, what are some thoughts that you have about you know the the uh, I don't know the the journey? Where where is low end going on records? I don't know. I mean, at some point, it's probably going to go the opposite way. I mean, it's probably about, at this point, almost as low as you're going to get it. <laughs> yeah, it seems like there's um, a lot getting put on albums. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to probably... I mean, there's always, you know, different things come and go in fashion. Definitely, this time period, I'm sure that in 
20 years, we're going to look back at it and hear the sound of low end on records from this time period and, and be able to immediately pinpoint it as from this exact time. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it just, it's probably, it's probably we're, we're bathing in the sound of the time that we're in right now. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's like, as, as things happen, it's just, I mean, I just get curious about, about stuff like that. I mean, when sometimes you hear like a hip hop record and you just can't even believe how much low end is on it and it seems relatively in control. Right. Um, and then that kind of seems like a, a game almost to me where it's like, if I'm working on a record that it's in some ways appropriate, it's kind of like you kind of want to play the game too, or you're like, well, yeah. I want to try, I, you know, I want to figure that out, you know? No, like, that, that's how I feel a lot too. It can, yeah. it can drive you a little nuts too. And then sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the artist is looking at me like, why are you trying to go there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely not appropriate for um, some styles of music and some, yeah, some people will be <laughs> not impressed by that. But um, I mean, if it occasionally it, it will work on, on different types of things. Um, I mean, the, seems like all the albums i'm working on right now it's completely inappropriate completely um, inappropriate yeah i mean nice. some of the stuff i've been working on is like kind of maybe faster mm -hmm. vibey rock music and um and when when the starts increasing to that point it seems like the less low end that you're going to get away with um or it just completely annihilates the feeling of of flying <laughs> interesting um, yeah. Do you want yeah. to talk a little bit about that, about, um, you know, what, what kind of considerations might we be thinking about when we're thinking about low end and the production and the style of the music? I mean, you, you point out, you mentioned that a fast tempo is going to require a different approach to the low end. What are some things to, to think about? Well, well I like think that, why, why is it different? Well, I feel like, like some of the music that I've been working on recently ha has a feeling of like, I mean, speed and, and maybe like entering the clouds and like a, like a breeze across your face and the feeling of nostalgia and like moving quickly. And, you know, it, it's a feeling, you know, and, and then I think that sometimes a tremendous amount of low end maybe gives a feeling of earth, you know, like feeling of like, of roots and like, and like, uh, like a, like, a, you know, structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think that like for something like Alabama Shakes or, or Britney, you know, it it feels like there's uh, it's it's wrong to say it's like rootsy music, but it feels like from the earth, you know, mm -hmm. like it feels like guttural. Um, and so I feel like it's it's appropriate for that. But but when you're trying to create the feeling of a dream and that you're lost in the sky and you're and you're moving really quickly, um, I mean, w which is maybe not the way I would I'd describe, you know, like a song, like don't want to fight. Um, then, then in, in the case of, of creating a, a feeling like that, then, then maybe low end doesn't really, really complement that color. Exactly. Um, it's just, it's just, a lot, I feel like the, the, the longer I, I mix, maybe the, the, the less I think about anything to do with technicality mm -hmm. and the more I think about like a feeling, um, and like, and, and it, like, when you think about, sometimes I think like before I even do a mix or if I'm trying to do an arrangement or something like that, before I just start do, saying something, if I think like, if I really think in my mind, like, like recently the other day I had to do an arrangement on something and, um, I had to build it, um, for somebody. And, and in my mind, I, I thought of, um, of, uh, what was the thought? It was something to do with some form of nostalgia in childhood, but it was something specific, and I don't exactly remember the feeling. But it was something that was just in my mind. It was like a nostalgic feeling. I can't remember. It was a specific thing, but something I thought of. Monsters so under I, the bed? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, that would be nostalgic. With it, it. <laughs> yeah, not, it kind of a, a, hor a horrifying feeling of nostalgia. <laughs> um, but that could be a good one, too. You know, it was just something like that where you, you just felt a, way, a certain way, something that you really felt before. And then, and then I kind of built the arrangement, just kept referring to the thought in my head, like as I would add something, be like, does this complement that feeling? Does this complement that feeling? Does this? And I just kept thinking about the feeling, you know? Yeah. And just like kind of following, like, does this do the feeling? Does this do the feeling? As I would add something, 
And then it really helped along the way. And I just feel like whenever I like really understand the feeling of what I want to do, I usually end up in a better place than if I don't. If I'm just kind of like throwing stuff around that I don't, you know, who knows where I'm going to end up. Maybe, maybe somewhere interesting, but you know, I'm kind of walking around blind a little bit, but if I, if I have the feeling that I, then, then like, I feel like by trying to learn the technical stuff years ago and getting it to the point that I, I knew what I was doing enough that I don't have to think about it anymore, I can work more on feeling than, than the technical aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like the description of, a, you know, a master musician, you know, somebody who studies classical um, technique or jazz theory right. until they get to the point where you don't have to think about it. I remember always wondering, you know, I was like, wow, does so-and-so, when they play a guitar solo, do they have to look at their fretboard or do they just hear it in their head right. and, and it just goes there? And that so- sounds a little bit like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, I mean, I wish I was that good of a musician that I could do that, but... <laughs> um, how about the... Um, interface between you and your world of, of computer or your, your console or whatever, are there any ways that you sort of remove the fretboard for yourself so you're not looking at the, the notes you're playing? Um, um, but, well, I feel like for me, the thing that maybe I'm most comfortable around is, is like a Pro Tools interface. Mm-hmm. I feel like when I'm looking at Pro Tools, I mean, because I've been using it since I was um a wee tyke. Know, 16 or something like that what's that yeah a wee tyke maybe maybe even, yeah maybe even 50 i mean 38 it's been you know 23 years or something like that maybe possibly and so it feels like with that amount of time it just it doesn't really when i when i'm looking at it, it it's it's almost like it's just um it's just a blank canvas to me I'm not even thinking about it anymore. You know, I'm not really thinking about key commands. I'm not really thinking about anything. It's just like the only thing at this point that I'm starting to notice is that maybe I'm starting to think about my hand hurting. Yeah. <laughs> because as I start to get a little older, my hand starts to ache. Um, what do you but, use, a trackball uh, or a mouse or something like that? No, it's my left hand. I think it's the key commands. I've started to wear my hand out a little bit. Um, um, but... But as far as beyond the physically, um, it just feels like an, an open canvas. So like when, I, when, I, when I'm working there, I just feel like I'm just free, you know? And it, yeah, the only, the only problems that I, that I, I find are, are the ones I've made for myself where I've kind of like boxed myself in with a mix or something like that. But I don't really feel like it's technically a problem. It's just like I've kind of like maybe lost the path and I'm <laughs> right yeah now do you, know. you um as a way to avoid that do you try to sort of commit to sounds along the way so that you don't have as many variables in front of you when you're mixing or do you find that like like many of us there are a lot of buttons you could reach for right now in this mix um i feel like i get a lot of times like i'll get maybe to certain places along the way and and then I feel like I'll, I'll make stems or run run the whole thing through like um, a tape machine, so that I have like a clean slate. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm kind of liking where I'm at, a lot of times I'll just kind of I'll stem it out, and then I'll continue working on it from that point. And then at some point, maybe if I've like realized that maybe the guitar tone that I've manipulated too much is now not working with where I brought it, then I can always reach back into the original session and, and grab it again. Um, but okay, I, I so don't, you leave yourself a little bit of a breadcrumb trail if you need it. Yeah. But I feel like, um, I feel like I, I don't like it when it's get, when the, when it starts getting too complicated, the, the pro tool session, like it, I, and I, I feel like it's be, the sessions become so crazy. I, I feel like I just can't even think anymore. I can't even, I can't even really make like a new mix decision. Mm-hmm. Then sometimes that, that becomes a, a point at which I have to kind of like clear it out because there's just, I just it's, it's like um I feel like I'm a pretty messy person in my life but as far as Pro Tools goes I'm I'm kind of a a, a neat Nazi. I can be I th- I think I can be that way too in certain ways. Um, I grew up in a messy household. My mom was a oil painter, and you know uh-huh. I, I'm comfortable around chaos, 
but when I'm but I'm very particular when it's time to create something. I'm very specific about s- stuff. Um, yeah. And I I wonder, have you ever felt like uh, have you ever found yourself thinking like uh, somebody might be like, hey man, have you seen the new computer? And you know it can do it can do everything. And your uh-huh. response might be like, that's the last thing I want. I want a computer that can only do eight things so that I can never commit beyond that. You know. <laughs> Or never, right. never try and do this ultimate balancing act of all the plugins and everything and hundreds of tracks. Yeah, I mean, I'm not like I'm not really obsessed with getting like the new computer and everything. Like, I mean, I kind of need a new computer right now because it get, it starts to get to the point that people start sending you things and and there's a, uh, suddenly a plugin that you can't get anymore. And uh, right. and then I'm just like, okay, well, I guess now it really is time for a new computer. But I don't I don't really necessarily need that to i don't i don't feel like i need a new computer to be creative I, if this computer stayed like this for the rest of my life I'd, i feel like i could still make albums and i'd be fine it just gets to the point where like you're you're, you're trying to collaborate with people and and the technology runs out on your side <laughs> yeah i know that feeling the keeping up with the joneses bit a little bit um yeah and uh, also it's that same feeling like you know something new comes along and then you look back at something that you did that you're really proud of and you think, but I just, but that old thing, you know, that old computer I'm using is the best record I ever did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll hear like a mix that, I, that I'm proud of, like somewhere and I'll go like, damn, that, that one worked out pretty well. And then I'll open the session and it's just like these ancient plugins, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. There's some, there's some old plugins I miss. Um, yeah. I can't even remember what it was called. It was this freeze plugin that was around for a while where you could, it just kind of froze the track in really weird ways. Yeah. I mean, I like, what it was called. yeah, there was, I mean, like weird old amp farm or something like that. I mean, you remember the mic I, modeler? That was an early one. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah, I do. API Audio has been designing mic pre's, compressors, and EQs for more than 50 years. Every product they make includes founder Saul Walker's original proprietary op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound in your studio. Whether you are writing songs for fun or mixing Grammy-winning hits, API has got you covered with individual modules, rack units, and dedicated consoles to make sure your next record is your very best. Go to API audio.com Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your track stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the US. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. All right, so let me see here. You 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 brought up guitars and um don't want to fight. I got to go back to that one again. Good mm-hmm. lord, those guitars sound so amazing on the beginning of that song. Um can you talk a little bit about just just recording guitars? Um what do you remember about doing the guitars on that record? Um well, it wasn't like most of it was like uh kind of the 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 genius of um Brittany and Blake and, and Heath. Um they they kind of all had their you know tones dialed in pretty pretty hard. Um that song in, in particular, I'm pretty sure I don't know if there was like a Genesis that came out came from like maybe Brittany had brought a little bit of something in. She might have. And then they were jamming off of it. Um and so I don't think that the guitar tones were were really so much a design to the song as they were like they, the, the the song was kind of designed around the tones that they were playing that day. It was kind of, a, I do know for sure that it was like, there was a long jam happening based around the riff and stuff like that, that was eventually kind of became the song. Yeah. Uh, Cause I remember they were all out and I remember Blake was in the room and everyone was jamming on it. And it was like, a thing, thing and it was becoming a thing. And I remember being in the control room and I, and I had some like real for in that song in particular, I had like a real vision as tonally for what, what I, what I wanted to sound like. And I remember that I was like really into wanting it to sound a certain way by the time they came into the, the room to hear it. Um, 
maybe the most on the entire album. That was the one song that I felt like I was like, I, I, why, I think it's your tell. Like, uh, and I was really into this thing. And I, and I had like a couple of drum mics and I had like, um, I think like this decapitator setting on this one mic or something that I was really into. Um, and, um, the song kind of just like really became something really quickly on, on the day that they were jamming it. And it was like, they really figured something out. And I, and I, and I feel like, um, that was like maybe the moment I felt like I was most like, I had the most clarity on the, maybe that entire album as far as like sonically where I, I had it like a, a thing. Um, I I feel yeah, like I also it, noticed that the bass playing on that is um, the the drums and the bass. Those guys really do a great job of unifying and not fighting each other, and you know, working yeah. well together, which is nice. Yeah, I mean that that was like really like they they were all out in the room, just like really hashing out that arrangement, um, and yeah, it really kind of worked worked well for that song and and also just the great verb on those guitars too which i guess maybe is uh, i don't know if you remember if there were discoveries to be made in you know the plug-in world or if that really is comes from great spring reverbs on amps but um, yeah i think most of that album uh i don't think there was really any plugins like that kind of going on it's getting the Even right the, kind of sound initially right yeah yeah uh, um uh and then we, there was like there were spring reverbs in, you know, that they had, but a lot of it was chamber. There was like a nice chamber at that studio in Nashville. And so a lot of, a lot of, I think most of the reverb that came on, that was from that record came from that, that chamber. Where were you guys? Were you over at Blackbird or somewhere like that? Um, no, we were at Sound Emporium. Oh, Sound Emporium. Oh, that's a great studio. Yeah. And they uh, had two chambers in that room. So I think we would choose which chamber was nice. appropriate for each nice. song. Well, at least they didn't, thank God they didn't have 50 chambers. <laughs> it yeah, felt like yeah. plugins all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> um, uh, shoot, what was I going to say? Oh, guitars. Um, might you have been inclined to put more than one microphone on a guitar amp? Would you have been quick to reach for a dynamic mic or even a ribbon mic for stuff like that? Do you remember any of that? Yeah, there was definitely um, mostly ribbons. Like some, I think. Um, some buyers and and definitely all the guitars in that album were mics um front and back oh front um, and back of the amp yeah um and then just blended uh, in different ways to get different tones from the front or the, sometimes just the back even you know i don't do enough of that i honestly don't do enough i did it on a record and i loved the results we got and you and i talked about that because margaret glassby when she came into my hay bale studio Right. She was like, hey, you know, we've been micing the front and the back of the amp. And I did it and it sounded fucking awesome, you know? Yeah, it really sounds great. Um, yeah, it's like what a are some, ma- you like, layer how would, of tone. Uh, sorry. How, how would you describe to the rock stars what they might expect to hear when they're micing the front and back? And do they need to, like, flip the polarity of one mic or anything like that? Yeah, I usually have to flip the polarity of one of them. But um, it's just like a... I mean, it's just like the back, you're going to get like a, it's an odder tone, but it's like a deeper, richer, it's richer in some ways because you're not just getting this spiky mid-range coming out of the front. Um, and it, it, it's, yeah, it's just, it's a complementary in, in a lot of ways to the front. You're just getting more out of the whole machine that is an amp. Um, so, I mean, if you have the channels, it's not, it's it's not a bad idea to see what even you get out of it. I mean, if, it, if it's garbage, you can just delete it. Yeah, um, and then wh- is there anything you want to think about as far as the distance from the mic? Like, where are you putting the mics for something like that? And also, this works only if it's an open back combo, right? Yeah, it works better, but I definitely have tried it in in, in many different um, ways. I mean, uh, it's you know, you just might get some garbage, but like, who knows what you're going to get out of anything. Yeah. Um, um, uh, oh, sorry. What was the first part of the question? Um, I guess what, like, where are we putting the mics? How how far away, oh, close or near or far or the same distance? Were, you to you know, they each were, of them? for the most part, pretty close. Um, I think sometimes, if it wasn't like the full band playing in the room, because a lot of it was tracked all together, um, then occasionally we'd uh, maybe pull it away a little bit just to see what the kind of different tones you could get. Okay. Cool. Um, so like. 
I think at some points too, we actually had a, a 67 that we, we put fairly far away from the amp um, and, and use some of that as well. Dig it. So if we have a mic that we would typically stick in front of the amp, we might stick one behind the amp about the same distance away from it or something like that. Or like you said, yeah, that's, try that's anything. What I try. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I do remember that it was there were some amps in, in, in uh, closets and stuff that we had maybe some sixty sevens kind of also further away from the front of it, and even, maybe even the back. Okay, cool. Um, let's see uh, another song off that album, um, "Sound and Color." Mm-hmm. That's got that beautiful vibes intro, and oh, then, yeah, and then it almost sounds like a, another recording of the vibes comes in to join the band. Um, can you talk about uh, what you remember about that that song and that part of the session? Yeah, um, the vibes at the beginning were were vibes that we, we rented, um, and um, yeah, th- that I can't even remember what the whole situation was. But um, Blake, in particular, I remember was very specific about that intro. <laughs> I remember spending a long time about the on the intro. Yeah. Um, um, and so that was rented to do the intro, but I can't even remember exactly why we didn't do the whole song with those vibes. But, um, the second half, I believe we're taking the vibes from her original demo. Um, uh, that's, had, that's where the vibe idea appeared probably. Yeah. She had bought vibes. Maybe the, maybe, you know what, maybe it's possible that they were actually even the same vibes, but she just had recorded the first, the second half up from on her demo and then she brought the same vibes to the studio to record the beginning i think it's just it's just completely it's recorded completely differently well somehow or other you, you know that song starts out with what sounds like to me like the greatest recording of vibes i've ever heard in the history of recording vibes <laughs> oh yeah i think we had every microphone in the studio on it <laughs> I, I it was one of those overdubs so because we had so many microphones up essentially because you're already tracking you can just take an army of microphones and start walking it towards an instrument yeah and see what it does yeah yeah that's fun i I, it's one of those funny things sometimes i get the best recorded sounds when it's in the middle of a tracking and you have no choice but to just grab something and use it yeah and you end up with like i love when um we do a piano overdub and it's there's not enough time to set up mics on the piano so I just take an open mic that's already there and go try it. And then we try yeah. it. And then later it's like the greatest piano overdub sound I've ever gotten or something. You know? Yeah, it's great. And, and it's, it's super useful when you're already in a tracking session, you can just turn on the whole room, you know, and even if you sum it down, you've got this like crazy kind of ears all over the entire room that you can use in some ways, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it sounded like maybe there was a, a bass on an organ joining on the intro too or something like that did you guys yeah, use much organ on that record do you remember yeah there was there was a, a a b3 i think that's what might be at the beginning um i can't we're totally remember now it's been a while but i'm almost sure it was that is that pretty do, do you do a fair amount of sessions where a band might say like oh let's put organ bass on this and then is that often if we wanted to do an organ bass are we going into the Leslie to, to mic that part? Or is that usually the speaker that's right on the organ itself for, for the low end and the bass? Uh, that was definitely, uh, I think, a Leslie. And it was just um, a microphone on the bottom of it. Okay, cool. Have you ever yeah. tried that trick? Um, I don't even remember if it was John Lennon or somebody who's credited for it, of taking a microphone and hanging it above the amp and just spinning it around to kind of create a reverse Leslie. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like I do that a lot because um, I, I don't often have a Leslie with where I, I want one, so I'll just spin one around the room. <clears throat> it seems like something, if, if someone's in a bad mood too, you can distract them by doing a fun game. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, with that topic in mind, can you think of any other kooky, fun game you know, tricks for the studio like that? I mean... Uh, you know, taking a microphone and spinning it around in the space and seeing what it sounds like. Uh, I, I still haven't tried that, believe it or not. I haven't tried that. Oh, really? I got no excuses. 
Uh, but an- <laughs> another one that comes to mind, which um, maybe we talked about this, and I bet you're familiar with it, is like you take the two jam boxes across the, a room and you you know read a sentence into one and then you play it across the room, record it on the other, and then you play that one across the room back and forth until the, the words go away and all you're left with is oh, this like morphing room piece. tone. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that piece by if I'm pretty blanking on his name. Um, it's a famous like John art piece. Cage or something like that. I don't think it was John Cage. I'm bl- I'm blanking. It, it, there's a piece of music that's it was an art installation where and someone they're reading. Oh, why can't I remember the guy's name? He's reading. Um, I am speaking into the microphone, and I am reading. And he describes it, and they play it back, and then and then it goes on for like an hour as it keeps going back and back and back, and then by the end it's just this crazy kind of ambient piece of kind of textural sound that's totally it that's got to be the source for you know however yeah. the hell i discovered it yeah it's it's a cool it's a cool thing um, um any other fun stuff like that that comes to mind for you if, if not right now and you think of it later just jump just interrupt and and spit it out but i bet you've got some cool stuff like that that you've tried in the studio yeah, I feel like mis- most of my days are spent <laughs> trying to do something like that. Um, I feel like I'm often distracted by wanting to do something like that. So I feel like almost most of my time is trying to figure out <laughs> what what other activity I'm going to get up to. Um, it's hard to even really name them all because I, I honestly feel like that's most of my days are spent distracted by doing something like that. <laughs> nice. Well, I like that you give yourself permission to do it. And I also like that it has helped you make some of the greatest sounding records ever. Oh, thanks. Um, because I think a lot of times we might feel like that sounds like a great idea, but I've got to, you know, finish this in an hour. I don't have time for something. And maybe we just all need to give ourselves a hell of a lot more time. And well, you know, we're in quarantine recently, now, so we got it, right? <laughs> we, recently, we did like a really elaborate one. Um, there was this guy named Devin Gilfillian. Um, and his record recently came out and, um, he has kind of a very beautiful kind of nostalgic, um, uh, kind of soul voice. Um, and they wanted to make, uh, you know, essentially a modern record, but you know, the, the touchstones of, of kind of the music that he does kind of come from a place of like, you know, like Motown and stuff like that. Mm Mm-hmm. And so um, I had this kind of crazy idea when we recorded the album was um, like a lot of, a lot of, you know, records now, well, maybe not now, but maybe some of the more early, earlier hip hop records and stuff like that, you know, obviously they'd use a ton of samples of, of Motown and stuff like that. And so I thought it would kind of be cool to forget the, the point of the fact that he does want to make a modern record, but make the, make the, the kind of soul record first, and then we'll make the modern record after. Um, so forget about anything modern to begin with. And, and so we went to the studio in LA called Vox that has a ton of old equipment, and we used nothing modern at all, um, no computers, no anything. Um, and, we, and, I, and I found some reference points for each song of some old records of just kind of tonally, because I didn't want any kind of my modern mind to seep into it. And I... And I kind of like heavily a b back and forth to kind of match stuff to get it to be similar to kind of uh, these reference points. And then we recorded it all to tape. Um, and then we um, edited each of the takes that we uh, had it right all to tape. And then we um, mixed it that day. And then we um, mixed it down um, to tape. And then we did stems all to tape. And then I took those stems to... Um, uh, the mastering room and we made, uh, vinyls of all the stems, um, of every, of every instrument. So the drums, the bass, the guitars. And so then we came back to my place. And by the time we came back to my place, we only had, um, vinyl. Um, That's awesome. And each and record so, was just one track. Yeah. Each record was each a, a different song. And so then we would import the vinyl. And then from that point, we could sample the drums. We could sample the bass. We could sample. And so we just sampled, ourselves basically and we had all these kind of old tones and then we we forgot about the fact that we were making this old record we made like what you know basically what we could to make a new record um just using all this all this stuff off the vinyl of all these different samples that we'd had um and i mean i don't know if it comes across when you listen to it i mean i think that it definitely 
informs it in some ways for sure, because it definitely, it, 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 I mean, the pro- I feel like sometimes I get stuck into different ways of a process, you know, because once you've been doing something long enough, you're like, this is the way I do it. And just by throwing a wrench into my entire um, methodology, it's suddenly like, well, this is the way I'm doing this because I, my hands are, I, are tied behind my back. And in fact, I went to such a degree that like, I didn't even, I didn't even bring them all. I, I had, did, I did a, when we were recording it, I did do a backup to the computer. I never opened that sessions once. And I, and I even, I had the multi-tracks, but I didn't even bring those to my place. I only brought the vinyl to my place. So I didn't have any choice. The only thing that I could use was the vinyl. Um, That's great. And uh, yeah, it was really fun. So uh, they, the, the drums, obviously, because they were stem, you can't resync a kick drum and the snare drum and everything like that. I could only use the full kit bounce stem. Mm-hmm. So the entire record, I was just working with a, a stereo stem, um, which was also a fun thing because it's just like it, sometimes you have a cool drum sound when you're tracking. But then throughout the record, you kind of destroy it for some reason. I don't even know why. You're like, oh, I'm really improving this drum sound, but you're maybe ruining it. And this record, I literally couldn't do anything except, you know, nothing. I couldn't do anything. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. No, I definitely know what you're talking about, about destroying the drum sound. I feel like I've patented that technique. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very yeah. frustrating and I'm, I'm glad to hear you describe that too so you uh-huh. know the rest of us don't feel singled out but you know it's really amazing remarkable to me how we can start from a sound that sounds great and then start mm-hmm. doing stuff to it and then you go back later and listen to them back to back and you're like what happened it sounds yeah. this sounds much smaller than where i started you know or sometimes like i mean i do it to myself too but like it's a lot when you're when you have a clear head on music it's easier to think about like, for instance, when I'm mixing something that I haven't tracked and occasionally I'll get a session and there will be 400 um, plugins on a drum set. Mm-hmm. And before I even mix it, sometimes I'll just like take everything off that someone had, you know, not to be con- contrarian of what they had done, but just to see like what they tr- recorded, you know, and I can see why they eventually got to the point, but like the drums that they had sounded beautiful. And if you just turned them up, you know, sounds really real and great you know they don't even i don't even need to do the plugins during the height of record making the spectra 1964 100 series preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for tom dowd muscle shoals stack studios ardent studios and new york city record player bringing you the sound of zz top aerosmith bruce springsteen king crimson john lennon and many more The 100 series amplifiers offer extremely stable high-speed circuit design with unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic recordings. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio with the STX Mic Breeze, BBDI, and Comp Limiters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-064. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone, the Spectra 1964 STX100, and C610 comp limiter. A gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you. And if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. 
Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. All right, next question. Um, Brittany's voice, powerful, powerful voice. I've recorded her in my studio on an SM7 and thought it sounded pretty great. Um, you got a lot of great vocals on sound and color on the album. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, stuff you remember about recording her voice and mics you might have tried? It sounded even like on uh, Future People, like you might have reamped her voice or something like that later. Um, yeah. Uh, the, uh, there's... I mean, yeah. There's a lot of stories about the recording of of her voice on that that album. There's uh, probably one of the most experimental vocal recording sessions of my life. <laughs> um, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that we, were, I mean, specifically Brittany Blake and I. I think we were all just kind of. Um, I think we were excited about just trying different things on, on that on that recording and i think it was just it was really um a lot to do with i think it was inspiring her to sing into different kind of situations uh, you know she's yeah. so cre she's so creative and, and she gets off on stuff like that where whereas some people you know it may turn them off but i mean for her i think i feel like that's that's part of the fun um and so yeah we tried uh we tried all sorts of stuff future people was was a crazy mic she bought off of ebay um, nice. And, um, I don't even remember which, which microphone it was, but I do remember that it was a real pain in the ass to mix <laughs> <laughs> because, um, she sings a lot of that song in falsetto. Um, and so, I mean, nowadays they've got the soothe plugin, so it kind of dots out kind of like harsh frequencies, mm -hmm. but I remember the, the microphone was really aggravating some like kind of, um, kind of different because she was singing in falsetto like like kind of different frequencies that would kind of poke every hit now mm -hmm. and then and so uh i remember i had to go in on that song it took me like two days i think every word and, and eq like just little pieces of of different things out of each word oh and just sort of like of, adjust the levels clip gain and things like that uh it was that but it was a lot of like 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 eqing um like the tiniest fragments of, of eq out of each word like a different frequencies on every word wow um it took forever i you, remember you gotta and, have some serious focus how do you even hold on to the memory of what part of what word had what frequency in it to help you you know well it was like I think it was just like, as I was going, I just kind of was running into different, because it was recorded so strangely. I mean, in the end, it kind of had, it has a cool texture, but to get to that point, I really had to go through some pain because it was like every word had like a different thing. So I would just loop a word and, and it was through looping the word. I would just kind of like figure out what was hurting me. Mm-hmm like the one frequency that was popping from because of the strange frequency range of the mic. Um, it, it, I mean, it, I just want to be clear. It was definitely not her voice. It was just like, it was the, the strange microphone. Yeah. Um, no, I've done so, strange microphones and struggled to like, yeah, <laughs> I've struggled to try and make like a bullet mic sit right in the track, even though it seems like the coolest idea when we used it, you know? Yeah. And so like, it, 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 I would just go, I would just like loop the, the word and then find the, the the pain that I was feeling, and then pull that out, and then like, and then audio sweep that word, and then go to the next one, and then just go word by word by word. Wow. And then and then listen through to that that line and see like, does it feel like cohesive? It was like it was a lot of that. Well, 
Um, <laughs> it's, this sounds funny to say, but that's encouraging to hear you say that. <laughs> 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 and and the reason is um, because it reminds us that you know a, a production and a mix like that where the vocal ends up being this great um, benchmark to strive for to inspire us um, didn't require a bunch of a bunch of you know, what it didn't require one perfect choice that was going to be just the right fit for the entire thing, and it didn't require uh, fancy gear or anything like you. The EQ choices you just talked about that could have been a stock EQ. Yeah, yeah, find, well, yeah it was just the. Know, I, re- I remember specifically it was the Waves Q. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and and but at the core of being able to pull that off is all about getting to know yourself and your own system well enough where you can get in a zone and dial in and just like make it through that until you get from the beginning to the end. You know? Yeah. In fact, the, the way to get to that was picking the wrong choice of microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Um, awesome. Let's see yeah. what else I got lined up. Um, maybe we'll go on to another record here. Uh, Casey Musgraves, congratulations on getting another Grammy for golden hour. Um, oh, thanks. Do you want to t- just share any stories about uh, that that process and what was it like to work with all those guys? Um, it was really great. The um, um, I got a call. I had I haven't I hadn't listened to like a, a lot of you know modern country music in a long time, um, and but I had listened to her. Um, I I had really liked her her records. Um, I was a fan. Um, I thought she was incredible. Um, so I got a call about mixing her record. Um, and, I, and I, and I even thought I was a crazy choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I got a word that, that, that they had maybe reached out to, um, um, Kevin from Tame Impala to mix it. Oh, um, right on. And so I don't know if that's true or, or for what happened or, or whatever, but I, I had, I had heard that that was something, so it kind of got me excited to that maybe I would, you know, try some things maybe that I would have been a little bit more conservative about as far as mixing um, when I was doing it. So maybe I pushed some of the guitars maybe a little harder and things like that than maybe I normally would have. When I listened to when I, when I was mixing it, it felt like I was being a, a crazy person. Um, also, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, she was obviously like a a huge artist and, and doing, you know, really well. I I did not realize it would do that record would do as well as it had or did. I mean, like it did. Um, I mean, I didn't know it was going to win album of the year. Yeah. (laughs) If I, if I had known it was going to win album of the year when I was mixing it, a lot of the decisions I I made would have been way more (laughs) conservative. (laughs) I would have been, I would have been, um, terrified. Um, but I, I, I feel like I was just kind of, um, I mean, Craig recorded it unbelievably well. So, I mean, I was working from a point um, uh, like that, that was already like just like the best place you could work from. So a lot of what I was doing was, you know, just, you know, screwing around and, and making things kind of weird at some points and stuff like that. And when I, when I listen to it now, the things that I thought at the time that I thought were crazy, maybe don't come across as crazy as I thought they were when I was doing it. No, I mean, Oops, when I listen to it, I hear, um, I hear something interesting. I hear, I hear Nashville in there. I mean, I, cause I hear, you know, some of the people I know, like Ian and Daniel and Craig and, you know, people that played on it. Um, and I hear, uh, something that sounds right for that record. Absolutely. But then I also hear like a real adventure and like bold, you know, the reverbs and the effects and and the kind of the etherealness of it. I hear all that being really bold and, and damn, you got some great snares on that record too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot, uh, really that was a, uh, mostly them, you know, as well. Like, like this, I mean, the snare, I mean, Craig recorded, like, yeah. I mean, it, he's an unbelievable recording engineer. Uh, yes. I mean, he's just ridiculous. I mean, pulling those tracks up, it's just like one after another is insane. And the etherealness too, I think is really, um, I don't know exactly where the vision came from as far as like who in that group. I know for certain Casey had a real vision as far as like um, a feeling as far as like, uh, you know, the feeling that even in her artwork and everything to do with like, I mean, even if you just look at like her Instagram, 
it's like she has such a specific idea of of the art that she's making and, and who she is and, and what it is that she's creating. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in it down to like her wardrobe, like literally everything. It's kind of what what I was talking about earlier, where you have an idea of your feeling. Um, and so a lot of the ethereal elements were kind of built into it. And initially, even on her voice, I had mixed it kind of drier. Um, Almost, I, I, I had thought of her voice more in a way like the way like um, sometimes the way like Rick Rubin talks about a record where it's like kind right. of really dry and right. maybe more of like that kind of LA like, you know, almost like a seven, like a Fleetwood Mac thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and, and then when they came to the studio to do notes, they kind of pulled up the reverbs that they had been using um, in the rough mixes and were showing me about this ethereal thing that I, I hadn't really latched onto it as much as they had created. And so um, a lot of in the, in the um, kind of revisions of the mixing, we, we, we kind of were going over the, the feeling of this ethereal thing that they had created that, that, um, that I had kind of destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to rediscover it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that um, yeah. So, I mean, it was definitely like um, there was a, a, a real, uh, yeah, that, that was a real team a real great Nashville team that had been created with that one. And were those, these all new people for you to work with? Yeah. I never met any of them until they came here and, and then they did. And I just, I loved all of them. They're just like such a joy. Um, it's such an amazing experience to have people arrive and you just like, you know, it's kind of, kind of, kind of be um, a little stressful when someone arrives and you're like, don't know who you're, who, who's walking in. And every one of them, it was just like such a, nice event to have all those people in the room you know yeah such nice people and went out to dinner and it's just great that's awesome great I, I don't know all of them but i know some of them and i like all of the ones i know very much <laughs> yeah yeah so 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 nice and, and such a good atmosphere to be working in you know just a, an atmosphere of creativity and and fun and and like really you know i think that that plays into the music and you know it, yeah, I, I feel like that's part of it where it's just like, you know, no one's in like a, a rough mood, you know, trying to do the, the, trying to do this album, you know, it's just people with a real vision, but, you know, being, being really sweet about it and, and working towards a goal, you know, in a, you know, fun, adventurous way. That seems like the fun way to make a record. I, and, and even in the Alabama Shakes record, it felt that way too, you know, like a celebration. Um, it's just like everyone united trying to make something and, and feeling good about it, you know? That's, that's the way to make music. And that's why we get into music in the first place is because you have some experience that's like that and you think, that was awesome, I want to do more of that. And then yeah. somewhere along the way you discover that not all records are like that and you have to, you know, you have to be wise enough to start going, I think I won't work on records like that, but I will work on records like this. But I yeah. will recognize that I have to work on some records like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you never know. (laughs) PreSonus has everything you need for your music or podcast production. Studio One is a great choice for your DAW, whether you are writing songs, creating EDM and pop music, recording bands, mixing, mastering, composing for film, or recording voice, and producing a podcast of your own. A flexible sketch pad, chord charts, key recognition, effects pedals, amp simulators, virtual instruments, including a killer drum machine, built-in vocal tuning with Melodyne, and 37 fantastic sounding plugins for mixing will allow you to create whatever inspires you. PreSonus provides you everything you need for your studio from microphone to digital interface to headphones and speakers so that you can easily set up your home studio for professional production. Get started now with the low-cost Studio One artist and join PreSonus Sphere for access to all their software, a complete learning library, and creative collaboration in the community at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com. 
home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. What sort of things do you remember about the mixing, um, the way you were mixing Golden Hour? Were you mixing in the box in Pro Tools? I think I think you're always using Pro Tools on some level, right? Yeah, it was pretty much. It was all in the box until the end when I when I, I stemmed out across the console. Um, and what, what console time, did you decide to do that on? I have a small API here. Um, a lot of times when I'm mixing a record, if I end up in a big studio, um, if I, I'll usually do a mix first at my place, and then I'll bring it to the, another studio. And if I, and then usually I try, I try to put the faders at zero and work, uh, you know, from the point I was at. Um, okay, so is that sort of something we might consider as a process? Like, feel free to just do everything in the computer. And and it's cool at the end to just kind of like what what do you discover when you break it out at the end through a console, and you know just to give us a a rough description of that in case this is brand new to somebody, how how, how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, I think that there's like a, a feeling of of openness a lot of the times of the way that it just combines all the elements together. Um, it's just it's it feels like more of like a, a a human stew or something. Um, <laughs> that uh, sounds a little it, creepy. I mean, too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you do it really like uh, properly and you, and you, you really, um, you know, you, you really get the console to, to really pull up your mix the exact way that you had it. So you make sure every, every fader really is at unity. Mm -hmm. um, then, then you can actually just sit there and, and uh, a, a, B your mix back and forth with, what's coming off the console back into the computer and what you had before. And it, and it's telling, uh, you know, cause you can hear right away what, um, what you're listening to. Uh, I often monitor my mixes by busing them into a, a channel at the bottom of my mix. Um, just a track. And then I keep it an in input. Um, and then I print mixes on that channel. Um, and so, um, sometimes, if I if I were to um, print the whole like if I were to suddenly have a an in the box mix and now have a mix that's going through the console, I can flip back and forth between the mix that's in the computer and the mix that's on the console by pressing the input button. Mm -hmm. um, um, and sometimes I'll close my eyes and I'll press the input button as fast as I can, like a whole bunch of times, and then I'll 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 see if I can tell really what is the console and what is the computer. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I love that. <laughs> um, and then, because sometimes, you know, you can play games with yourself. Um, but but really, I mean, sometimes it really is like you can really tell like, oh, wow, this is clearly the console. And it just, it's more open. There's like a whole other ceiling to it. Like it just feels different. It feels wider. It just feels everything. Um, do you notice, uh, so I imagine that in, in the high end, it can sound smoother or clearer somehow. Um, but also in the low end, does it sometimes sound like the low end? You're like, oh, now the now the bass just sounds fixed, or it sounds right somehow. Yeah, yes. Sometimes it feels like, yeah. Occasionally, like you can't you can't get the bass to sit in the computer for some reason, and then for some reason you run it through the console, and then you bring it to the car, and all of a sudden it magically just locks in. Hmm. Who knows, who God knows why? I don't know. <laughs> all right, just so, all of a sudden mixes so, itself. So to help people understand this a little bit, so um, how many? If we're going to break it out. Um, do you, do you have like eight stereo pairs or 16 stereo pairs? Is that, is it that kind of breakout where you're just trying to put things into little stereo groups or are you actually breaking yeah. it up, putting the kick on one, you know, I'll do both. I'll do both. Um, I've played around with both. Sometimes I'll do like, if it's a mono channel, I'll do mono on the console. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just figure out what unity is there. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I've, done, I've tried both where it's all stereo pairs or I've done mono situations, all sorts of things. And if you do uh, mono, you have to either recreate the pan or it only works on yeah. something that was panned up the middle anyway, right? Yeah, I have to do all that. Um, I have to figure out your whole, that whole situation. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I've done both. 
Um, and, um, if I'm lazy, I'll just do a ton of stereo pairs. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> it's a lot easier. Um, and then, um, and depends on how many um, faders I have on a console, then I'll just do as many as I can. Um, we, I did another album with Blake Mills where we did this album called per- Perfume Genius. Um, and we were working at a studio in Hollywood. And it just so happened that the night that we were finishing mixes, um, uh, there was nobody in the building and they had about four studios. Um, and, um, we, um, asked if we could print it through every console that night. Cause it would just take us like half an hour to go through each room, you know, and just print. Oh, actually it took longer than that. I don't even know how long it took us. Half an hour is completely wrong. We somehow sounds did like, it. We sounds somehow like my time, time management. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we somehow did it pretty quickly though. Cause we did get through it all in like pretty quickly in one night, but we went through all of the consoles in this building and printed the same album through all of the consoles. And then we even did it at my console at home. That's what uh, I, Tom, um, Tom Petty did that. Oh, he did. Yeah. I remember hearing, um, I don't remember what record it was. It might've been, boy, it might've been wildflowers, but I don't remember Richard telling that story, but they wanted mm-hmm. to decide what studio to mix in. So they pulled up, and I think it was Tom Petty. They pulled up, um, uh, it could have been Neil Young, though. It sounds like a Neil Young story, too. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, you know, pulled up the same mix faders up on every console in his studio and just printed it without doing anything else. And then they just yeah. decided which one sounded best to him. Yeah, that's what we did. I, we blind tested. I sent it out to everybody, and everyone picked the same console. <laughs> which, which one did you end up picking? My uh, API. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, you yeah. cheated a little bit. You made it... I have to be louder. I swear to God, I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah. Are there any tricks when you're stemming out from Pro Tools through the console? Are there tricks where you like you you run a 1K tone and then you just mat- make sure the levels are matched or anything like that? Or is it more just doing things by ear? No, I do I do it like 1K tone. I, 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 I go pretty exacting. Okay, so if you, had, yeah. if you have stuff going out of stereo pair... pair um, then you would just put a 1K tone on the output of your stereo stem bus and Pro Tools and, and make sure that was the right level through the console. Yeah, I'll just send the same 1K tone through every single um, f- fader and make sure that they all are at unity when they return back to the computer. I see, I see. Okay, right. And then and then from there, I'll just output every different... Um, uh, source from my, my my session to each of those stereo channels. Right. So yeah, I would, for some reason in my head I was imagining you had to put a a tone on the snare track, but you don't have to do that. You just need to make sure that the faders, what goes oh, in, what comes what out, what goes is in the same. comes yeah. yeah the same yeah. Okay, and then at you. that point you can just bust everything out yeah. and return it. Yeah. All right. Um. Let's see. Uh. Some other stuff. Um. So you were so you did Casey was uh, mixing it in the box and then coming out through uh, stems later on. Why you're mixing it in the box? Would it be typical for you to have stuff on the stereo bus that's part of having the right sound at the mix? Yeah, definitely. I I, I think that almost ninety eight percent of the mixes I do I start with a stereo bus, um, something happening that I start working into. Um, I think. I don't have a template or anything like that, really, as far as like the, I think some mixers might be, I, I sometimes I see how many credits people have in one year and I think it's just insanity. And I feel <laughs> like they must have some kind of just mix template that they're using because <laughs> there's no way they can mix that much. Well, all, um, all I can say is, what do you want, credits or Grammys? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I feel like sometimes I'm a little slower because I don't necessarily have a template as far as like, like for kick drums or snare, I don't have anything, but what I do have is kind of like a mix bus starting point that I change a lot. I mean, by the time I'm done a mix, it's all over the place, but that's kind of the one thing I have. Um, and from there I just kind of do anything. Um, what do we have to do to get you to tell us what that mix bus starting bus is? I mean, it's like, there's like 25 things on it. And, and most of the time, um, I, I, I run a song through it and then I just A, B, what bypass stuff 
until I kind of like the sound of a starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I start from there. Um, and, and so the things that would go through it to discover the starting point would be the whole song, Faders Up? Yeah, I just basically put the whole song through a bus and that, that has just a ton of stuff on it. And then I just bypass things that are in my, my chain um, to get it to a point that I just kind of think, oh, that kind of sounds kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And then I, start, then I turn everything off and start mixing the song. Okay. But you can't tell us what those 25 things are because then you'd have to kill us, right? Oh, I mean, it's just, I, 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 I mean, it's probably a lot of the same stuff people have. I mean, limiter, Oxford limiters, plugins uh, and stuff, students and, and um, some uh, multi-band things. Uh, I actually don't like using, but occasionally I try to, I try to use it. Mm-hmm. Um, EQs, uh, like different tape emulators. Mm-hmm. Um, Wideners, um, just a lot of you know garbage, like all the things, <laughs> all the yeah, things, yeah. rock stars, all the things you already know about and you're scratching your head about. Put them all on there, turn them all off, turn them on until yeah. you decide which ones you like. I guess, and, and, and then, then and then I and then and then when I start mixing, then I start tweaking the master bus throughout the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, it's never it never stays the same. It's just like. It's just a starting point. I, th- I like to think of it as kind of like a wall of, of harmonic distortion so that so that when I'm working on my mix, my mix is actually like running pretty quietly. Mm-hmm. And it's just different layers of gain staging that's bringing it up to a louder level. So that like I feel like if I turn something up really loud in the mix, it's not clipping and it's not like clipping my bus. It, mm-hmm. because it's already so quiet. Like even if I turned it up as loud as I could, it still wouldn't clip my bus. It's just, it, all it would do is create like maybe some harmonic distortion because of all the plugins that are, you know, walling it off, you know? I love that, man. Uh, I'm so glad you just broke that down too. Cause I think that's a really important takeaway from that. It, yeah. I mean, I just, I feel like that's what I like working into that ceiling as, as opposed to working into just digital air you know, endless digital air <laughs> where you're not working against anything. I feel like I'm like, I feel like it, when I have nothing on the bus, I'm, I'm just like, I, I feel like I have nothing to press into. Yeah. And, and also it's just, it's really frustrating when you're learning to mix and you try to make something louder and there's no room left to go and everything yeah. just gets worse as you, as you push your fader up and you're like, what, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Yeah. Cause then you're literally just distorting. Um, and th- th- this way, I've created a realm of distortion that I, I actually like. Right. A so realm of distortion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the realm, that could be the name of your studio. Yeah, the further I push, like the further I, I work my way to Mordor. <laughs> there you go. The secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier circuit, extremely low self-noise, and transformer-coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jayzmike.com. The legendary API sound can be described as punchy and bold with a distinct in-your-face presence. For more than 50 years, API Audio has been advancing their design of consoles, mic preamps, compressors, and EQs. But what API founder Saul Walker got perfect in the very beginning were the proprietary op amp and transformer designs. And today, API still offers the very best for your studio with dedicated rack units for mic pre, EQ, and compression, and consoles from small to large with the bottom 
box 1608 2448 or full size legacy access, and they even introduced the original 500 series lunchbox to studios everywhere. But most importantly of all, no matter which gear you choose from API, you can count on the original op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound. Because the next record you make could be your best record ever. Visit apiaudio.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins and pre-sona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Um, let me ask you another question. So this one um, is about High Horse by KM. Um, I think that was in your your playlist. And you start out with this uh, cool DJ effect where you like filter out the disco loop on the drums as it starts. Do, do you, oh, does I, that ring a bell? I think actually um, I might not have mixed that one. Okay. Might- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's just talk about that effect though, because I'm sure you've done that before. Um, um, I, I love that, like that DJ trick of opening up. It's like instead of a drum fill, you just sort of open up the filter on the drums. Oh yeah, um, like the like 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 a high like a low pass or a high pass. Which, yeah, like a low pass. Yeah, like Ma- Madonna did that on one of her tracks. Um, like maybe it was Hey yeah. Mister DJ or something. And it's like the chorus is nothing more than opening up the filter on the drums more. And I was like, that's um, brilliant, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, occasionally, like I've done that um, on stuff, um, and sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm. Sometimes I feel like there's a part of me that I'm like, I can't do this because, like, I feel like it's like and people are just gonna be like, "Oh, you're using that same thing again." I've, I've so sometimes I've tried to feel like I've, I've tried to figure out different ways of doing it without the EQ, mm-hmm. um, like just it makes it fun for me because I feel like it, that th- those are the kind of that's the kind of thing that sells, sends me on like a, a like a crazy uh, wormhole where I'll spend a whole day doing, like like you like I'll take a microphone and I'll walk from another room into the speaker to, you know to get the kind of effect. I was like, just what? I was just imagining that as you were thinking of other ways to do it. I was like, I wonder if you could just walk up to a speaker with a microphone. That's very strange. Or there was one time there was a band. Um, it was actually a band, Local Natives, that. Um, they on their demo had a situation. I can't even remember the name of the song. It was on not even their last record, but before it, um, where there were drums in their demo. It was part of the arrangement where the drums were filtered in the verses and they were not filtered in the choruses. And I just, I just didn't want to do it with the EQ Mm -hmm. just to waste time because I want to (laughs) waste as much time as possible. So there was, um, I, I got a bunch of, um, those like water bottles, the big jugs yeah, and filled them with water and then, um, put 57s in these, um, condoms and then put them in the water bins. And then wherever I had microphones on the drums, I put a, a water bin beside the microphone, you know, so there was two sets of microphones on the drum set. That's great. And so, and so that we, in the verse, you could pull up the microphones that are underwater. And then in the chorus, you could pull up the ones that were in the chorus. And what it did, but it, it does the same effect, but it just kind of led into like a, a little bit of a different play on it, you know? Now, is it important which condom brand you get for this microphone? Trick? Yeah, Magnum for sure. <laughs> Magnum. I feel like that, I've heard Silva, Sylvia Massey talk about that, that too, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you just reminded me, now I know what to do with all those five-gallon water jugs I bought yeah. at the beginning of uh, you know, the epidemic. <laughs> And we yeah, haven't even the, tapped into yet. Um, there was also um, my friend um, Rado, Jonathan Rado, 
he's he was in a band called um foxygen um we pr- co-produced a record by a band named Houndmouth in um uh austin together mm-hmm. and we had made all these tape loops with this band um and we were trying to do a filter of sound like that as well and um so we'd recorded a bunch of passes of like this tape loop that we were kind of playing on the console it's hard to describe but we had like um all the different all these different kind of pieces of the um, arrangement that were running on a tape loop that we yeah. were then recording back from the console back into pro tools that we, that we were arranging the song with the console by like muting and unmuting tracks and stuff yeah as the tape loop was playing but then going back into the pro tools um yeah. and then um we wanted to have like a, a filter like we wanted to be able to use like filtered moments and we were on um we were at that studio in el paso um on on the um almond farm uh nice i mean um, maybe it was it was a farm i can't remember but um so there was like a like a, a truck and it was in the middle of the night and so we took this tape loop and we got into the back of the truck and it was like um we we drove really fast down the um, country lanes dragging this tape loop through the gravel um oh, until it was just like completely <laughs> destroyed and then we it was like in, in shards it was barely holding on. Then when we got back, we did the same tape loop through the machine and, and then did the arrangement again. And then we had all this other layers of the arrangement where it was kind of like really filtered and broken and, and you know, get all these other stuff. You that know, was I, another. I remember when I was in college and I took the, um, the like contracts and legal course and the lawyer was teaching and he just, he, he taught us a term called OPM, which stands for investing with other people's money but i like uh-huh. that you put a twist on it opm for you means other people's machines so you make yeah, sure yeah. you do that <laughs> at somebody else's tape machine. Yeah, yeah i would have done it on mine too nice, <laughs> um, uh-huh. and yeah didn't uh, didn't the beatles do a bunch of that like trashing the tape and crumpling it up and yeah. putting it back on i forgot yeah. which one that was for yeah i'm not sure but it's definitely it actually works it's, <laughs> it sounds great that stuff is fun and let me ask you this so uh, you know, as we're all hearing this and we're like, that just sounds like the most fun way to make records. I want to make my next one like that. How do you, and you know, you joke around about the time that you want to dedicate towards that part of the process, but how do you go into a record saying, um, this is the appropriate amount of time to explore things and arrive at, you know, these cool sounds so that we're, you know, so that we we finish this record from beginning to end. What advice do you have for us about that? I mean, I don't know if I am the best to speak on that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the fastest ever. Um, I mean, sometimes take th- sometimes things take a little bit longer. Um, and I mean, if someone's willing to do the experiment, I mean, sure, it can add a little time to the record. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, I guess you know, I feel like I'm always getting a little bit of trouble by the end of records because you know people are trying to finish and you're and you're trying to you know, to put the gas on, but you know, I just feel like to get morale up and just, you know, make something that's unique and discover something. I mean, you're trying to make art. Mm-hmm. And I think that like, you got to kind of try some stuff. You got to go down some kind of wormholes or like, you know, what am I doing? I mean, am I just putting microphones up and just recording this mute? I mean, I can do that. Sure. I mean, but I, I mean, I feel like part of that reinvention is what makes records exciting and that's part of why when you listen to the beatles you think this is so exciting sounding and like why does this music feel so fresh is because people were you know trying things and inventing things and you know maybe it does take a little bit more time but i mean i need that just to feel excited about what we're doing and 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 feel like we're inventing something And, and and i feel like a lot of the times the way to the ways to discover are are by at least trying some of that stuff um yeah, I think that's I mean, good. I mean, I, when you mentioned the Beatles, I think of the early singles that didn't excite me quite as much. Yeah. Maybe those are a little more exciting just because they maybe perform well, but sonically less yeah. so. And and then the stuff where they're in the studio experimenting, that's where it gets really interesting. So maybe that's all you do. You just tell your client, you just play them two Beatles songs and say, which one sounds cool to you? Which one do you want to do? <laughs> I mean, also the Beatles, when they recorded those first albums, I mean, they, they were in a different position than almost maybe any band on earth is at the moment in that they probably had more playing hours 
literally no band is playing that amount of time right now. I mean, they're not yeah. playing. No one's playing shows right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they they had they were playing every single day, um, nonstop. I mean, unfortunately, there's that that situation doesn't really exist anymore where clubs hire a band and people just play. Mm-hmm. Well, All day. now you might have to take that back. We have downtown Broadway in Nashville. Where yeah, they, well, that's true. Yeah, where, you know, yeah. maybe uh, Nashville I, might be the only city where that's. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, that's that's under that some real uh, there's some real mm-hmm. hot um, discussions going on about that right now. But anyway, uh-huh. I agree with you. I think that's great. I love that. You know that concept of playing a lot. I mean, Motown, all the, all the house bands, like the Swampers, Motown, all those guys, you know, they got to play all day, every day, which was pretty amazing. But, um, I think my, my takeaway from your answer to the question is you use the word experiment. So it's maybe intentionally going in with an artist and, and calling it an experiment as the first stage. So that it's like, everybody understands that that's what you're doing. Yeah. I think that maybe it's just that I, I feel like that's maybe the, the, just the way that that I feel like maybe I approach it every time. I, I guess I, I I feel like I haven't really just gone in and, and tracked a record where I just put microphones up casually and that's it. That that's all that I've done. I'm not even sure I've ever done that. Uh, I don't even know if I'm capable. Because to be honest, I, that isn't actually why I got into this. Mm-hmm. I mean. For some people, they, that that is really the reason that they they get off on it, and and I mean, I obviously have no, like nothing against that at all. That's you know, the way that people, the, the way people, some people work. That's just the way they work, and, and that and they get incredible results by doing that. Um, I think that just for what gets me off, um, just putting microphones up and recording it. I don't know if that's the reason I started doing this. Um, it isn't, in fact. I know it's not. Because the, the things that I started recording when I started, the reason I wanted to start recording was because I wanted to figure out how to make um, the sound of an um, Inuit choir. Um, and and really? I, couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out how to do it other than to learn how to record. Um, and so, like, specifically, the only reason that I, I started recording was to figure out how to do weird sounds. And then along the way, I learned recording. Um, you know, in the, in the, in the classical way, but my brain is just like stuck in the mentality of trying weird things. And th- and that's what gets me excited every day. What so does wake, an Inuit choir sound like? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's just the kind of thing that like gets me so excited. I mean, this morning I woke up and the thing that got me so excited, just like popped in my head was, I don't think I've ever heard a pedal steel orchestra. Like if someone... Ooh just took like a, a classical piece and they did every single instrument, like, uh, like the violin section, they did all the violins, they did the violin parts, but pedal steel, they did the cello parts, they did everything, but all pedal steel. And I don't think I'm, I was like looking on the internet to try to feel it, see if it had ever been done. I never, I never see, I can't find it. I, I so, can like, tell you where to find it though. I can tell you uh, where to do it. Uh huh. Yeah, come to Nashville. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't play pedal steel to save my life. But if I could, I would have been doing it this morning. <laughs> have you had a chance to work with many pedal steel players? Yeah, a few. It's a beautiful instrument. I, I yeah. think the more that I hear it in my, I mean, I've heard it my whole life, but I feel like I'm more entranced by it as I get older. I think that it, it has like a real ethereal um, element that really kind of has like this spiritual vibey element that maybe I missed when I was a kid. Kind of like, when you hear it in kind of real bad country music, it, it gives me a kind of bad feeling. Mm-hmm. But in great country music, it's it's incredible. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a beautiful instrument, and I've I've said this before, but I, I feel very privileged to be in Nashville and to have recorded some pedal steel players where you get to know it and you realize that it's it's as deep an instrument as as a grand piano is. Yeah, I, my um when my daughter was born, I I took two months off and. My plan was that I was going to buy one and just put it in the living room so I could fiddle around on it and see if I could figure out anything by the time the two months were done. But I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got a, you got a, um, you had a baby. 19 <laughs> years or whatever, yeah. you know, 20 years. Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you 
nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Let me see. Was there anything else I wanted to ask you? Um, yes, you did work with, you did a couple of mixes for Beck um, mm -hmm. on Stratosphere. And I wondered uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that experience. Um, and I also wanted to say, what, what can you reveal to us about the sound, the Beck vocal sound? How would you describe what that is? Um, I don't totally know because I wasn't there during the tracking of it. Um, I don't really know like the kind of secret method behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of did what I would normally do with a vocal. I mean, in some ways. Um, uh, so I don't really know his specific way. Um, yeah, it was actually, um, it was like, a, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> well, so in other words, if we hear something and it's like, oh, that's that Beck sound, it, it may have arrived having a quality like that or... Um, yeah, and to be honest, I think um, I mean a lot of it might have to do with his voice too. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. sometimes I th I think that like some of these things in my life that I I'm kind of the the mystery behind them mm -hmm. um, are suddenly revealed to me when I when I'm with the person. Yeah, like um, like Weezer when I was younger, I worked a bunch with and and um, I was always kind of perplexed by what exactly the guitar tone was that Rivers got. You know, like that kind of like hash pipe chunky rhythm tone that Weezer gets. Yeah. Um, and one day he was at a studio and, and there was like a, I mean, a random guitar and a random mic amp. I don't know what it was. I can't remember, but it wasn't what he plays. It was just anything. And he, need, he needed to do a guitar and I handed it to him. And he started playing it. It sounded exactly like that. <laughs> 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 and, and I was just, uh, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I just, I guess I just put the microphone in front of it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I love it when you discover that with um, somebody singing too, you know, they have a quality and you, you know, your first thought is, oh, it's the mic and the compressor and the EQ and all this stuff. And then they sing on a 57 and it sounds exactly like that. And you're like, oh, it's their voice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I've, I did this record with the killers that's about to come out and, um, uh, the, um, Brandon, the singer does all of his micro, all of his vocals on a 58 and he has his entire career, every single vocal on every single one of the killers records is done on a 58. Wow. Consistency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He will not sing into anything except a 58. Well, that's awesome, dude. Well, um, <laughs> let me, let me ask you a closing question here. This one, uh, I asked you before, but I'll try and give it a mm -hmm. new spin. This is a uh, hypothetical question of taking the Wayback Studio Machine. Um, and if you could go back in time and, you know, find an earlier st stage of yourself, um, first of all, that'd be awesome and weird, and that would have been great for your rave scene. But <laughs> for, the, for the context of this question, um, if you could go back and give yourself one bit of advice and say, and, and maybe it's about your, the way you mix and, and you know, going through your process, but, but uh, doing it the, the best way that you want to. And you give yourself one bit of advice and you say, Sean, this is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio one day um, with your mixing. What advice would you go back and give yourself? Gosh, I don't know if there's, um, I don't know if there's any advice that I could just easily give myself because that the problem is that I don't think that there's anything bulletproof. Um, I think that, all that I know is just from experience and it's just like a millions of little tricks that I've just kind of picked up along the way. And so I think that the, really the only thing that the only way that I've ever become better was through time, um, and kind of frustration and, um, and just, you know, trudging through it. Um, 
I think that the biggest thing for me is, and always has been, is maybe, um, is, is just, uh, a being with other people's work that I admire maybe mm-hmm. and learn and learning from that, um, and figuring out not exactly maybe what they, how they did it, but like, like hearing something and feeling bad about what I was doing and then trying to feel how I could compete with that in some ways. And then it pushes and you really, and you discover like, you just discover something by trial and error at that point. Yeah. Uh, so a long time ago, I mentioned before I have a chalk wall in my, my studio and I don't even remember who wrote it, but someone wrote on the wall, compare and despair. And I believe what they meant by that was that if you compare yourself with somebody else, you're going to despair. So just don't do that. And I read that one day I was on my wall and I, and I, and I was kind of angry by it because I, I thought like that, that is bad advice. Um, I, I mean, yeah, you may despair, but in fact that that's what's pushing you is that you want to despair. Like you want to get better. Um, so I crossed it out and I wrote compare and repair. Um, because, uh, I feel like, the, that's the only way I got better is if I am always comparing and then repairing. <laughs> nice. Um, I like that. Yeah. And yeah. I, I completely agree. I think that it's that, um, it's that drive to make it better than the last thing we did that m- keeps us moving forward. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean, it's tough, tough advice to give myself. Cause I guess I would just say, just keep, keep trying. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, sometimes people, um, I mean, maybe musicians or something have started out or like, you know, do you have any advice for me or how do I make it or something like that? It's just like, I don't know. Like, just keep going, <laughs> you know, like it's just arduous, yeah. painful work, you know, um, don't give up and just, it's painful. I mean, I feel like, I feel like also the best artists that I've ever worked with, there's, there is a, there is honestly something that I've learned from the people that I admire the most and the people that are extremely successful and the ones that are extremely successful and the ones that I've worked with that I notice over and over are the same with all of them is that they are, are crazy about, about their own, um, the judgment, the judgment of themselves. They, they are, crazy they they never listen to something and think that it's perfect or done mm-hmm. they will go in and in and in and in and redo and think and try you know and it's just like this kind of crazy tr- like this kind of craziness you know of wanting to be better and this just like journey um and and i think that that maybe like some people give up or or think that like think that the first thing that they did was like, Oh, that's perfect. That's done. You know, and when they, and like, they don't go into like that crazy journey where like it takes it to the next level where you, sometimes I feel like the best things that I've done, I sometimes feel like I'm losing my mind a little bit by the end of it, because you've gone down so many paths and so many journeys and looked through every single hole that you actually start feeling like you're going insane. Cause you don't think that there's any other place to go. And, and, and I think that that may be what I've discovered sometimes takes it to another place because it's just like you start going insane. And <laughs> That's great. Um, but I mean, yeah. what, like, you know, you also said the most successful. So somehow there has to be a balance between, you know, the, the getting it out there, the finish line against the, the you know, the, the never ending pursuit of perfection. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say though, that, that the people that are the most, the best artists that I've worked with are not the ones that necessarily need it to come out on a certain day. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that want it to come out the way that they believed in it on, on a day, you know, to make sure that it is the feeling that they wanted. You know, I, sometimes I feel like that that is the place of the management or the record company to pressure maybe the people in the studio a little bit more than, than I feel like I I don't necessarily feel like that's my job is to yell at people to finish it on a certain day. I mean, I'm happy to let other people yell at us to get it done because I feel like other people can sell the record. That's their job. My job is to make sure that it's the most beautiful record possible. 
And I mean, I don't want to like never finish a record. That's not my goal, but I don't want to put something out that is stupid. And that isn't the, 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 um, what the artist feels like is in their imagination. I mean, if I were the artist, I'd rather nothing come out than, than something that I don't believe in and something that the, the art is not up to, you know, par with what I believe. You know, if you have a vision of, of something, then you should finish that vision. Um, I mean, I think that an incredible record that is perfectly done, that is your vision, that everyone hears and, and will be blown away by is going to be much better for your career than, uh, than just filling in the gap of, of just pushing at more product. I mean, if you have an incredible visionary record, you could have a career for the rest of your life as opposed to some, you know, th filler. Um, I, I really do believe that, that a visionary record is going to, is going to like really push you further than, than, than just some random crap. That's beautiful, man. I love it. That's inspiring. Um, um, I know that, that I said that was my last question, but I do have one more question. The amazing outfits that you wear to the Grammys. Do you wear those in the studio while you're working too? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've always had a, I, um, I had a fun with, with, uh, dressing. I, I think that, um, I think, you, you know, you go out in Halloween and everyone's wearing cool clothes. I'm like, why don't people dress like this? Yeah. Why don't we you wear know? them all the time? Cause you know, that, it's, Cause that plastic yeah. ghost mask really makes my fet my face sweat underneath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, yeah, awesome yeah. dude. Well, thank you so much for being on recording studio rock stars with us again. It's been an honor and a pleasure to hang out with you. Um, where can the rock stars go find out more about you and, and about your music? Do you have a website or anything like that you want them to go to? Um, I don't really think I have a, I mean, maybe there is a website. It might just be an email to my it's manager okay. or something, but, um, I, I don't really have a good website or anything like that. I, I've thought about maybe maybe making a, a YouTube channels of, of art films, but um, <laughs> Ooh, <I like laughs> that's that. yet to happen. <laughs> well, in the meantime, Rockstars, we've got uh, links in the show notes, um, and I put together a YouTube playlist of a bunch of Sean's great work. So please go check that out. And um, Sean, we can't wait to see you again next time. Awesome. Well, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Congrats on becoming a dad. And uh, that's, you know, Thank I always you. say my daughter's the best record I ever made. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I understand that now. Yeah. That's indeed. incredible. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, dude. Look forward to seeing you in person and um, stay well and healthy. Cheers. Thank you. You too. See you later. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.